Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, second season of uh, these uh, non-local quantum gravity seminars. And uh, to start the season, it's our pleasure to have today uh, Souvrat Raju from ICTS, uh, who will tell us about uh, the holographic nature of uh, quantum gravity. Please. I'm not sure. That's uh, okay. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, th no, that's fine. Thank you. Sure. Let me just share share my screen. We can start. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, so so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me and for giving me this uh, chance to speak. Uh, you know the the titles of the seminars. I'm not quite sure uh, what the non-local was supposed to mean, but. It's particularly apt for this, this seminar, at least, since uh, the issue I'm going to speak about is precisely about a locality in gravity and the way in which uh, uh, gravity differs from uh, local quantum field theories. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a particularly uh, apt seminar series. Uh, so uh, yeah, and thanks everyone for coming. I'm glad to see so many friends uh, in the audience. Uh, it's too bad. Uh, I've never actually uh, been to ENS uh, physically, but I hope that when the pandemic ends, I'll get a chance to visit. Uh, so before I start my uh, seminar proper, I thought I should uh, just start by acknowledging my collaborators. Uh, so I'm going to speak uh, today uh, on work that's uh, done in collaboration with uh, many collaborators, uh, starting uh, with this paper last year with Alok, Siddharth, and Pushkal, uh, and then with Chandramoli and Olga. Uh, and then a set of papers we wrote with what we call the group of seven, which is how Andreas, Carlos, Lisa, Marcos, and Sanjeet. Uh, and then a more recent paper uh, with Chandramoli, uh, Victor, uh, and Olga. And uh, some of these ideas are reviewed in this uh, review from last year, which uh, you can find in the archive. So before I, I, I start uh, you know, uh, the technical aspects of the talk, I thought I would spend about maybe uh, 10 minutes uh, just showing you some, some pictures and some cartoons and saying some simple things. So I thought uh, that's how I, I, I uh, that's the first 10 minutes of my talk. Uh, and then uh, the idea I'm going to speak about today is what we call the holography of information. Uh, and I'll describe that first in flat space uh, and then some more recent developments and how that can be understood uh, from the wheeler divitt equation. Uh, and then I'll speak about black holes and the information paradox and the relevance of these ideas to that, that issue. Uh, and in the last part, I'll speak a little bit about uh, some uh, other developments uh, on a different track on islands and how the graviton mass is relevant for that. Uh, I didn't emphasize this part since I assume that most of the audience is not necessarily a string theory audience, but I'll be happy to elaborate more on the last part if necessary. So uh, let, let me just start by uh, gi giving you an overview of you know, what I'm going to speak about and just some, some rough intuition, physical intuition for uh, the ideas that I'm going to describe. So what do we mean by uh, the holography of information? So the message uh, that I'm going to try and convey uh, in this talk over the next hour or so is that in uh, quantum gravity, uh, quantum gravity has a very special property. And uh, that very special property is that the information that is present in the bulk of a Cauchy slice uh, in a theory of quantum gravity is also available uh, near its boundary. So in particular, you know, if you think of this as a schematic representation of a Cauchy slice, uh, there might be some, some bits or some qubits uh, in the middle of the slice, you know, maybe some sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, and the idea of the principle of holography of information is that that same information that's available in the bulk is also available in a scrambled form uh, near the boundary. So if you make sufficiently accurate observations near the boundary of the slice at infinity, uh, you can read off uh, what's happening in the bulk. So that's that's the, the main message of what I'm going to say. Uh, so just to make this sharper, let me emphasize the difference with ordinary local quantum field theories. So, you know, when we usually think about how information is localized uh, in quantum field theories, uh, you know, one of the basic things that guides our intuition is the fact that we can prepare a state which has an excitation in the middle, like the one you see on the left, and we can ensure that everything for an observer outside some bounded region, so an observer in this region, uh, looks exactly uh, like the vacuum. Uh, we also believe that we can change the form of this excitation. So, you know, we can, uh, instead of this bump, you can have a bump of a different shape, and you can still ensure that everything outside still looks like the vacuum. So, you know, we change the excitation inside this bounded region, uh, but the observer outside has no inkling 
uh, that we changed the form of the excitation. And that's something which is a very familiar property in local quantum field theories. The fact that such states exist uh, goes by the property, by what's called the split property in local quantum field theories. Uh, and this is just something that we often assume uh, is true of you know, localization of information, even if it's not stated explicitly. So what I'm about to say is that in a theory of gravity, uh, this is not the case. Uh, first of all, if you prepare an excitation somewhere in the middle, then you cannot make the state outside this bounded region look exactly like the vacuum. You have to have tails that go out all the way till infinity. But there's something more. Uh, the point is that if you change the form of this excitation in the middle, so you change this, this wave function in this bounded region from the one on the left to the one on the right, then you are also forced to change the form of these tails at infinity. And the argument is that there is a one-to-one -one map between these tails and the form of the excitation. So in fact, if you know the form of these tails, you know everything that's happening on the bulk of the Cauchy slice. And as you can see, this is behavior that's very unusual and very different from local quantum field theories. Uh, but I'm going to try and persuade you that gravity does have this behavior. So let me try and say this in an operational way. In fact, in this talk, I won't emphasize the operational aspects, uh, but this is the subject of the paper that we wrote with Ulga and Chandramoli. Uh, so you know, imagine that you have some web of detectors which is surrounding some object, some excitation. And uh, you know, in a non-gravitational field theory, we could ask, you know, what is the form of the excitation? Is it an ellipsoid or a sphere? Is it red or is it orange or some other questions? And these detectors, if you think of a detector and imagine one detector living at the intersection of every latitude and longitude, then these detectors would have to wait for signals to emerge from uh, this excitation in order to be able to answer this question. Uh, but in a theory of gravity, the claim is that this information is always available outside. So the detectors can switch on and switch off for an infinitesimal amount of time. It might later take them time to be able to process the information and to you know, determine what the form of the excitation was, but they don't need to be on for more than an infinitesimal amount of time. And they always know the form of the excitation inside without having to wait for signals to emerge. Okay, so why should this be true? So let, let me, so I'm going to give you more, more detailed arguments, but let, let me just start by saying, you know, why should we believe that there's happens in local quantum field theories? So I'm going to start with something that, you know, all of us learn uh, at our mother's knee, uh, uh, which is the uncertainty principle. Okay, so the uncertainty principle, which is a very basic aspect of quantum mechanics, uh, you know, tells us that if you localize something in momentum space, then it's completely delocalized in position space. And of course, in relativity, momentum goes together with energy. So if you think of the wave function of some particle, which has a very sharply localized energy spectrum, like you see on the right, then this particle is very delocalized in position space. Okay, that's just something uh, basic, which we know about quantum mechanics. But of course, you know, this doesn't prevent us from preparing localized excitations. You know, we prepare localized excitations all the time. There's, you know, I'm localized here. Uh, many of you are localized in different countries. And, you know, the fact that there's an uncertainty principle doesn't pre prevent us from, you know, preparing excitations that are confined to bounded regions. And the way we do it is that, you know, you take one wave function, which is peaked at some energy, you add to it a wave function that's peaked at another energy with some phase, you add to it a third wave function, which is peaked with a third, a third different energy, have a third different phase, and you keep going on to infinity. And if you do this in exactly the right way, then you can ensure that you get in position space, a wave function that is peaked in position and interferes destructively everywhere outside some bounded region. And that's the way we prepare a state which has some finite amplitude for being in this bounded region and has zero amplitude for being outside that bounded region. So that's so far so good. That's just basic things which we know about quantum mechanics. So what's different about gravity? So what's different about gravity is the fact that gravity has just a humble Gauss law. And the Gauss law is again, something that's familiar to us. We learn it even before we learn the answer to anti principle. And the Gauss law tells us that, you know, if you have uh, some, some mass in gravity, then you can determine the energy of this mass uh, or this energy of this excitation uh, out from infinity. And we, of course, use this all the time. You know, we know what the mass of the sun is, not because any of us has been to the sun and determined the local energy density, but because we use the Gauss law uh, 
to look at the fall off of the gravitational field. And in fact, in general relativity, this expression I've written here is the ADM Hamiltonian. So this is the definition of the energy. It's the fact that you know, the energy is defined by the subleading components of the metric and how they fall off at infinity. So you might wonder why this changes anything or how this is relevant to what I said previously about you know, localized excitations. But in fact, if you think back now to you know, our simple wave function of a particle, uh, which was delocalized in this way in position space, then uh, you see that you know, this particle I, I said at the beginning had some sharply localized energy. And as a result, this particle, the wave function of this particle, if you think about it in a theory where you have both quantum mechanics and gravity turned on, uh, has to have a tail that extends out to infinity. So it has to have a tail that extends all the way out to infinity. And that's just how it is. And you might still wonder what the relevance of this is. But the point is now, you know, remember I told you that we, we were preparing localized excitations. The way we prepared those localized excitations is by taking these particles uh, and by adding them together with the right kinds of phases. But now each of these particle, these matter wave functionals is entangled with some gravitational degree of freedom. And this is really a different degree of freedom. You know, it's a degree of freedom that extends out to infinity. And so what you need to superpose is now some wave function, which is some matter wave function entangled with the tail. And you need to superpose it with some other matter wave function that's localized at a different energy. It has to be at a different energy. Uh, for the, you know, if you wanted the, the full matter wave function to be localized. But now this is entangled with a tail of a different kind. And when you keep going like this, the main point is that these tails prevent the destructive interference outside a bounded region. And I want to emphasize uh, something that's already clear from this intuition, which is that it's not only the energy that determines the state. And that's, that's something which is very important. Rather, it is correlation functions of the energy and other observables at infinity uh, that are enough to completely determine the state. And the basic intuition uh, is simply this. It's the fact that the uncertainty principle forces you to take these superpositions of different energies. In gravity, each of these has to be entangled with a tail. And this entanglement is of the form that you cannot have destructive interference outside a bounded region. Uh, of course, what I've told you right now is just a cartoon, uh, but this intuition will be relevant uh, when we go forward and when I give you more technical details. So this is just a very rough overview of the physical ideas uh, that I'm going to try and present uh, in this talk. Second, me. Okay, good. Um, Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me start now by making these ideas more precise. By the way, if any of you have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt and I'll be happy to answer them or wait till the end as you like. So I'm now going to try and make this idea precise in flat space, what I told you precise in flat space. So in flat space, the precise statement is as follows. Uh, so imagine uh, that you have four dimensional asymptotically flat space time. Um, so here's, asympt here's a Penrose diagram of asymptotically flat space time. In fact, this Penrose diagram is always the case for me because even if I have black holes, I'm going to imagine that they always evaporate. So eventually the Penrose diagram is always trivial for me. Uh, and the statement is that all information about massless particles that in a non-gravitational field theory would have required observations on all of scry plus is in fact available near the past boundary of scry plus. Uh, there is a similar statement one can make for past null infinity, which is that all the information on past null infinity is available near the future boundary of past null infinity, which is this little orange region. Uh, but to avoid duplication, I'll just talk about uh, future null infinity and its past boundary. And you see that this is a precise version of the statement that I made previously, because if you think of massless particles, then uh, null infinity is a limit of Cauchy slices. Okay, so it's, you take Cauchy slices and you push them up further and further, and then you can specify, you can still specify all the data for these massless particles, either on scry plus or on scry minus. And what I'm telling you is that although in a non-gravitational field theory, you would need data, you would need observables on all of null infinity to determine the full state, in a theory of gravity, if I give you observables right here in this little red region, that's enough to entirely determine the entire state. So that's a precise statement of what I said previously, the, the uh, cartoons that I showed you previously. 
Okay, so let me try and give you a sketch of the proof. Uh, I, the, the, the proof is in this paper that we had last year, but I, I'll just try and give you a sketch of how the proof goes. So first of all, of course, uh, you know, it's important for us that we are in asymptotically flat space time. Uh, so we fix the asymptotic boundary conditions and we allow the metric to do whatever it does uh, in the bulb. Uh, the asymptotic boundary conditions we consider are the standard boundary conditions that have been used to study four dimensional flat space times. And with these boundary conditions, you know, you demand that the metric goes to Minkowski space at null infinity, the leading components of the metric. And then you have subleading components. And these subleading components can be of various kinds. Uh, some of them describe the dynamical fluctuations of the metric, and they go by the name of the Bondi news. Others are constrained components, which determine the mass of the that's left inside the space time. This is called the Bondi mass aspect, and the integral is called the Bondi mass. And there might be other massless dynamical fields in the theory, in which case we also look at the, the, the subleading, the tails of those observables, which are again the one over r components that you can read off at null infinity. Okay. So in particular, I'm going to be interested in the algebra of these observables on all of null infinity. And that algebra is just obtained by taking all possible products and linear combinations of these observables. And the algebra of interest to us is this algebra that we'll call A minus infinity, which is the algebra obtained by taking these operators for retarded time between minus infinity to minus one over epsilon, where epsilon is any number, uh, any finite number, and uh, taking the algebra of operators that are confined to only that region. So in a non-gravitational theory, this algebra would be a small subalgebra of the full algebra of operators at scry plus. Uh, but in a gravitational theory, you can approximate any operator in this larger algebra arbitrarily well by using an operator from what was a smaller algebra in a non-gravitational theory. So how does this proof go? Uh, before I go to proof, I have to say a little bit about the Hilbert space. Let me tell you that. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done um, on understanding the quantization of uh, massless particles in four-dimensional flat space time in the past few years. Uh, this, of course, goes back to much older work uh, by Ashtekar and Fadiv and Kulish, and more recently by Strominger, compare Alok, uh, Miguel, and many other people. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what these authors found is that the right way to think about uh, the Hilbert space in flat space is to recognize that the vacuum is not unique, but rather it's infinitely degenerate. And these infinitely degenerate vacua are labeled by what are called the super translation charges. And there's an infinite number of these super translation charges labeled by a spherical harmonic. And to specify a vacuum, I need to specify uh, the value of all of these super translation charges. And once I've given you what this vacuum is, then on top of each vacuum, one can build a Fox space as usual by just taking these news operators, smearing them with some test functions and acting on this vacuum. And the Hilbert space of massless particles that I'm going to talk about is the direct sum of all of these Fox spaces. Uh, we have some more recent work on massive particles, but I won't talk about that. I'm going to restrict in this talk to massless particles. So now uh, here is how, uh, let me just sketch for you uh, how we prove the fact that uh, you can identify any state in the space of massless particles only from observables at A minus infinity. So the, the argument uh, goes as follows. First, we recognize that any state uh, that belongs to this Hilbert space can be approximated arbitrarily well by the action of an element of the small algebra on the vacuum. Okay. This is a version of what's called the Riesz leader theorem, although we don't assume it, uh, we can prove it by using just the positivity of the Hamiltonian. And this is not special to gravity. So I want to emphasize that this statement, the first bullet point would also hold in a non-gravitational quantum field theory. It's the fact that it is always true, even in a non-gravitational quantum field theory, that the algebra of operators from a bounded region acting on the vacuum can generate an arbitrary state. But it's also true in the theory of gravity, since it requires, in our case, only the positivity of the Hamiltonian. Now, what is special about a theory of gravity? What is special about a theory of gravity is the fact that the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. And this is also true. This is true not only in general relativity, it's also true in quantum gravity. And since the Hamiltonian is a boundary term, 
you know, in an operator algebra, if you have an operator, which is part of the algebra, then all its spectral projectors are also part of the algebra. And the reason for that is very physical. It's the fact that, you know, the basic bond rule of quantum mechanics tells us that if you make a measurement of an operator, then, you know, you can get various answers. And the probability of getting those answers is given by the spectral projectors of that operator. So in particular, because the Hamiltonian is a boundary term, the spectral projectors and the projector onto these different vacua are also available in this algebra that I was calling A minus infinity. And this is a very unique aspect of gravity. The fact that the algebra at the boundary of a Cauchy slice contains the projectors onto the vacua. Okay? Uh, and this uses, as I said, the fact that the Hamiltonian and also these super translation charges are boundary terms. Uh, then there's a third aspect, uh, which one can just verify by a concrete low energy calculation, which is that the transition operators between these different vacua, so I said the projectors onto these vacua are part of this algebra A minus infinity, but in fact also the transition operators between the take you from one vacuum to the other are also part of this A minus infinity, and this one can just check with some calculation, and it's a very simple calculation because all you need is something that has non-zero super translation charge, so you act on this vacuum, you go to another vacuum, and then you project back and you can generate operators of this kind. So you see uh, now, uh, you know, it's just a basic fact of quantum mechanics that any operator that maps you from this Hilbert space of massless particles back to the Hilbert space of massless particles uh, can be written in uh, as, uh, you know, uh, by expanding in a complete basis of states uh, and in terms of uh, these elements of these different Fox spaces that we had. Now, as used uh, the Richlider theorem that I mentioned previously to write this expansion of these operators in a complete basis of states in terms of the action of an operator from A minus infinity on this vacuum and the action of the adjoint of another operator from A minus infinity. And I emphasize that everything up to this first bullet point would also be true uh, in a theory of uh, without gravity and does not require gravity. But what is special about gravity is that this operator that appears in the middle, uh, which is ket s bra s prime, is an element of A minus infinity. And consequently, everything that appears in this line, which is xn times this transition operator times xm dagger, is all manifestly in A minus infinity. And since the algebra by construction is closed under products and linear combinations, this tells us that you can approximate any operator in the massless Hilbert space arbitrarily well by an operator near the pass boundary of future null infinity. And since you can approximate any observable in the big Hilbert space as well as you like, this tells us that all the information about these massless particles is available near the pass boundary of future null infinity. Okay, um, if there are any questions, I can take them now or I can go on. Yeah, hi, maybe if you could clarify a little bit, but I'm a little bit confused, I have to say, because the degrees of freedom on scry, like the shear at any value of the retarded time u is a completely independent yes. degree of freedom from the shear uh, at another instant of time. So how does uh, it get mapped into only initial shear? This is what I'm not following. Yeah. Yeah, remember that we also keep track of uh, the Bondi mass. So the shear at uh, a late retarded time, in fact, does not commute with the Bondi mass at an earlier time. And uh, so that is what we exploited here. You see this operator TSS prime involved also the projector onto the vacuum, which involved the ADM Hamiltonian and the projector onto the vacuum that came from the ADM Hamiltonian. So if you look at the shear at a later time, that's in fact not independent of the ADM Hamiltonian. Usually one just writes down the commutator, which tells us hc is del uc uh, but in fact uh, what we are pointing out here is if you recognize that the spectral projector onto the vacuum is also part of uh, this algebra e minus infinity and combine it with some additional properties you can write the shear at a later retarded time in terms of the shear at an earlier retarded time and some uh, function of the adm hamiltonian which is the projector onto the vacuum but wouldn't this imply that then the shear at different retarded times are not independent variables uh, no, it doesn't. It, well, it's not that the shear at different retarded times. If you so the you know it's not uh, 
So if you look at the news commutators, which is the simplest things to look at, the news commutators are indeed delta function commutators, but the news commutator with the ADM Hamiltonian is not a delta function. So what, what I'm saying is that the shear at a later time is given in terms of the operators at an earlier time, but those operators in an earlier time are not only the shear at the earlier time, but also the ADM Hamiltonian at the earlier time. So it's the shear at a later time is, you know, the shear shear commutator may be some theta function, but if you look at the news news commutator, that's sharper. It's a delta function or delta prime. Uh, but the news at a later time is given in terms of the news at an earlier time and the ADM Hamiltonian. And that's not in contradiction with anything because we already knew that the news ADM Hamiltonian commutator you knows long range. Okay, maybe another way to phrase the question. Your Hilbert space, how many degrees of freedom does it have? It's the full fox space, so you can generate. You can generate. Uh, you're right that you can generate. You know, and that's what would happen in a non-gravitational field theory that you could take an operator, smear it with the shear at a later time, and act on the vacuum. But uh, you know, it, so you're right. It, it's a surprising result that the, you can write the shear of the news at a later time in terms of the news at the earlier time. But I'm pointing out that it's not in contradiction with anything, and we already knew that the news at a later time failed to commute with an operator from a minus infinity, which was the ADM Hamiltonian. And here we're extending it to point out that if you look at appropriate functions of these operators at a minus infinity, you can approximate the news at a later time as well as you like. And maybe it'll become clearer when I give some uh, examples later. Or, uh, so, if, uh, Rahul, you have a question also? Yeah, I want, I want to continue on the question on Simon A, just, yeah. just to make sure uh, I understand hmm? you. Because so, I think that's, that's the key question, right? It's the question of radiation. Yeah. So, are you saying that? N of u, which is the news at u, you want to write it yes. as exponential of the Hamiltonian, you know, conjugated by, by exponential um, and then you're saying m is part of this initial algebra. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's one way to put it, although that's not the... Uh, well, which formula so, so do, you, do you want to use for... Yeah. That's yeah. Formula, yeah. You, you could have used that formula. You could have said that you take n at an earlier time and you, you conjugate it with e to the i m. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's not the formula that I've written on uh, on the screen. Uh, on the screen, I said that you take the projector onto the vacuum of n of m, and then you use this Riefelder theorem. Uh, but if it's if it's simpler to think, in, yeah, we don't like the formula in terms of the conjugation of e to the i m because I think it makes things uh, appear physically more hard than they are. But if that's uh, that's a, a perfectly good proof as well that you can take uh, n of n at an earlier retarded time and conjugate it with e to the i m, and that would give you n at a later retarded time. Uh, although that's not that's not the proof that I have on the screen, but that's an alternate argument you could use. Uh, does that answer the question? Or I mean, I don't know. Does it answer for Simone? It, it, I don't think it answers the question whether it, it's kind of independent variables, but. Uh... Yeah, as you said, okay, it sounds I, uh, surprising. It does indeed. Can, can can I add to the confusion? Because I mean, if you if you think of uh, what Laurent just said, then I like to think of it classically. And then I know that the the ADM Hamiltonian is not uh, is not going to be the the Hamiltonian the generator of the Hamiltonian vector field that will evolve this news into the future, right? I I I need yeah, it's only the first information, right? right? It's what? Uh, yeah, so, so so it's important. Uh, I mean, it's precisely to avoid questions of this kind that you know I wrote things in terms of the projector on the vacuum. But there is no good classical analog of this. You know, classically, such a statement would just obviously be false because classically, obviously, I can prepare uh, configurations which are identical. You know, which differ in the bulk but are identical at the boundary. So uh, there is no good classical analog of this. Maybe when I give some good, uh, some low energy examples later, this will become clear. So I can, if there are questions about the class contrast with classical physics, I'll, I'll emphasize that a little later. So the classical limit of all this is very... Uh, yeah. Is zero. I mean, these correlators, remember I'm looking at correlators of the Hamiltonian and other dynamical observables. Uh, these correlators explicitly come with a factor of the Planck scale. If you take the limit where you keep the Planck scale, you know, uh, do you take the Planck scale to zero, uh, these correlators will all just vanish. Yeah, so, but I like, uh, to I like to recover general relativity in some way from your quantum theory. You will, you will get back classical physics and you will lose this, this property that uh, the information is localized in this funny way. So there's no obstacle in recovering general relativity, but general relative classical gravity obviously does not have such a property 
uh, of the kind that I'm describing. I mean, cl classical gravity is not holographic. So you will recover general relativity and you will find that holography vanishes in the limit when uh, you so take it. Does, does that mean that in some sense, the classical theory has more information than the quantum theory then somehow? Since it's not uh, holographic, so you need to give more data than the quantum theory, which is holographic. Well, that's a question of comparing infinities in some sense, because I need to give you an infinite amount of data in the quantum theory as well. I mean, right, but in it's the very understood the power yeah. two as opposed to infinity to the power three. So it's uh, uh, you know to compare. No, there are usually other parameters that appear in the holographic theory. So I mean, in the examples of holography where we understand the dynamics, here I'm just giving an information theoretic argument. But in the examples where we understand the dynamics, uh, there is to the power two, which is multiplied by an additional large parameter n. Uh, and so it's n into infinity squared as opposed to infinity cubed. So that's that's roughly how it works. So uh, th that, that's not something which my arguments will be fine enough to, to determine, but that's how it works in some known examples. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So le let, me, let me now, so there were several questions and maybe one question which someone could have asked, which uh, people, I guess, didn't ask is, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, we I, I gave some operator theoretic arguments, right? But let's say let's say uh, you know uh, someone would say you know these are arguments were too quick and maybe there's some error in them. I mean, how do we know the arguments are right? right? Someone could say, and in fact, we have been asked many times in the past. You know, in, I started this talk by saying that we have two wave functionals, uh, and in in non gravitational field theories, I know I can just write down some data of this kind, and I can also write down some data of this kind in classical GR. In classical GR, I take a, a configuration which is spherically symmetric. I change the, the density inside, but I keep the total mass fixed. And by doing so, I have changed the form of the excitation and kept the outside unchanged. And someone could say, what prevents us from just writing down wave functionals of this kind that we can write down in classical gravity and that we can write down in non-gravitational quantum field theories? So I'm now going to try and answer that question. Of course, the, the answer is that in the quantum theory, not all wave functionals are allowed. And the allowed wave functionals have to satisfy some constraints. Um, and these are the constraints uh, that uh, the allowed wave functionals need to satisfy. And of course, all of you know this much better than I do. Uh, but one of these constraints, the Hamiltonian constraint, is called the wheeler witt equation. And there's also a momentum constraint. And these constraints are simply telling us that you know, if you have a wave function, there's a gauge redundancy in the theory. And if you make a gauge transformation, that's the same state. And so the value of the wave function will better not change under such a gauge transformation. The Hamiltonian constraint tells you about how you move slices up and down in time, roughly speaking. And the momentum constraint tells you about invariance under spatial diffeomorphisms on a single slice. So the point is that not all wave functionals are allowed. And it turns out that if you impose the constraints consistently, as I'll show you in one example now, one is not allowed to write down configurations of the kind that we had on the previous slide, where you have some excitations of two different kinds and keep the outside invariant. So I gave you previously an argument in flat space. I'm now going to give you an argument in anti de Sitter space. Uh, the argument in anti de Sitter space is actually slightly simpler than the argument in flat space. And uh, what I'm going to try and tell you is that two solutions of the wheeler witt equation that, so this is that coincide at the conformal boundary of anti de Sitter space for an infinitesimal amount of time must coincide everywhere in the bulk. And of course, uh, for those of us who've worked with ADS-CFT, uh, this is kind of an obvious statement because you know, in ADS-CFT, uh, you think of boundary, uh, you think of the boundary theory at a single instant of time, that's enough to determine the entire state in the bulk. Uh, but the argument I'm going to give you does not assume ADS-CFT, rather it establishes a version of holography for gravitational theories. That being said, I should say that the argument in this paper works within perturbation theory. I gave you previously some you know, non-perturbative operator theoretic argument. The argument I'm now about to give you is a much more hands-on argument, uh, but the disadvantage is that it works only uh, within perturbation theory. Okay. So it's, but I think it'll help you maybe answer some of the questions that were also asked previously. So uh, of course the wheeler witt equation has been known for a long time and I, there are many people in the audience who've done a lot of work on it. Uh, but one thing that we found at least when we looked at, when we tried to study the literature is that perturbative analyses are rare, although there was some work done in the uh, many years ago by, by Kuchar and, and some follow-ups to that. Uh, and so in uh, this argument, we just use perturbation theory. 
And it turned out uh, to be convenient for us to think of the metric as the metric of empty ADS plus uh, some fluctuations HIJ, which we divided into what we call a transverse traceless component, which is just what you think it is. It's transverse and traceless, a longitudinal component, which tells us about spatial diffeomorphisms, and what we call a T component, uh, which is also transverse, uh, but keeps track of the trace of the fluctuation and which turned out to be important in the story that we had. It turned out to be very useful for us. You know, the Hamiltonian constraint is actually not one constraint, but it's an infinite number of constraints that one applies at every point. But it turned out to be very useful for us to just take the Hamiltonian constraint and to integrate it on a Cauchy slice. If one integrates the Hamiltonian constraint on the Cauchy slice, one finds that the integral takes the following form. It tells us that some quantity, which is the, which is something that depends only on the T component of HIJ and is an integral at the conformal boundary. That's this H boundary, which I'm calling here. The exact formula is not important, but the integral of the Hamiltonian constraint tells us that H boundary is the same as something else that one can call the integral of H bulk where H bulk takes on the form of, you know, involves the transverse traceless components of the metric only and other matter degrees of freedom and looks like a bulk Hamiltonian density. Uh, this might be related to the question that Alejandro asked earlier. You see, you know, I'm not assuming here that the ADM Hamiltonian or the analog of the ADM Hamiltonian in ADS generates time translations. We just impose on the wave functional, the Hamiltonian constraint, and we look at a particular integral of it, which we're allowed to do because it's a pointwise constraint. And we find that this integral forces the correlations of a particular component of the metric at infinity and the integral of other bulk components of the dynamical degrees of freedom. So this is just something that we get directly from the constraints without assuming, not even assuming that the Hamiltonian is a boundary term in the theory. So this is just saying, uh, you know, this is a constraint that all wave functionals need to obey. We can then actually solve this constraint explicitly. So we are able to write down explicit solutions to the constraints to only this integrated constraint. So I'm not trying to solve all points of the Hamiltonian constraint, but this integrated constraint, we can write down solutions. And these solutions depend on the matter degrees of freedom, which we call phi, the transverse traceless components of the metric. And this one integral of the T component of the boundary, which we call H boundary. And these solutions to this integrated constraint look like some Fox space uh, in perturbation theory, some Fox space excitation with a given energy of these dynamical degrees of freedom entangled with the, this T component at infinity being in a particular state. So if you think back to the intuition that I was giving you at the beginning, I said that if you think of solutions of the full wave functional in a theory of gravity, you have to have entanglement between the matter degrees of freedom and the metric degrees of freedom. You have to have a tail and there's some larger unphysical Hilbert space, which has all kinds of unentangled states, but the physical state has only entangled states, the physical Hilbert space. And here you see that the integrated constraint forces this form of entanglement where here's the matter degree of freedom and here is the tail degree of freedom. In fact, we can then analyze solutions of the remaining pointwise constraints, uh, which we can't write down explicitly, but we can show that you know, the remaining pointwise constraints basically fix the remaining bulk dependence of this HL, the longitudinal component of the metric and the transverse component of the metric. So what they do is they lift a solution of this integrated constraint that we had to a solution of the full constraint. But what is important for us is only this explicit solution of the integrated constraint that we can write down. Now, uh, what's a valid mixed state in the theory? A valid mixed state, so this doesn't only work for pure states, it works for arbitrary states, including mixed states, is just you take two solutions of these constraints, you take one solution, you multiply it with a conjugate, and you add, add this together with whatever coefficients you like, provided the total probability and so on is one, of course. And then all we need to do after that is take the solutions of the constraints we have and impose the equality of correlators at the boundary for an infinitesimal amount of time. And I emphasize here that the correlators whose equality we impose are this, this boundary Hamiltonian raised to the power n, 
multiplied with other insertions of dynamical degrees of freedom for an infinitesimal amount of time. And one can show, and the proof is not hard, it's in the paper, although I won't go through it right now, one can show that imposing correlators of the energy and other dynamical fields for an infinitesimal amount of time forces these coefficients C1 to be, if you take two different states, uh, you know, you take one state row one with one set of coefficients C1 and another state row two with another set of coefficients C2, then imposing the equality of these correlators forces the states to be equal, which tells us that these boundary correlators are enough to uniquely identify a state in the Hilbert space. And this realizes concretely the intuition that I mentioned at the beginning, where I said that, you know, you have to have matter degrees of freedom, they're entangled with tails, and the entanglement is such that you cannot have destructive interference outside the bounded region. And this is a, an explicit proof of that. Uh, rather than go through the details of the proof, I thought I'll give you an example. I mean, it, it's, a, some, it's some pretty simple algebra that we can see in the paper, but let me just give you an example, which I think will help to elucidate what is happening here. So uh, I'll make the example a little easy for myself and a little hard for myself. Uh, so imagine that, you know, we have two dynamical fields sitting in ADS. Uh, and they're just two scalar fields, phi one and phi two, and they're related also by a global symmetry. Okay. Uh, so they're related by a global symmetry. And uh, maybe in quantum gravity, we don't have global symmetries, but it doesn't affect our argument. So I'll assume there is a global symmetry that relates the two of them. And let me consider the following two states. State one is obtained by taking a unitary of the smeared field phi one and acting on the vacuum. State two is obtained by taking a unitary of the smeared field phi two and acting on the vacuum. Okay. If you like, uh, you know, here this unitary depends on the angle, but I can make these things spherically symmetric. And so now one and two, I have exactly, of course, the same energy. You can even make them spherically symmetric. And the challenge is, you know, make observations at infinity and distinguish one from two and also determine this function f of r. So once again, going back to the question we had about classical physics, obviously in classical GR, there is, this is, it's impossible to distinguish these states because all you can tell from outside is the total energy if they're spherically symmetric. And you certainly cannot tell whether the field is made of you know, particle A or particle B if they're related by a global symmetry. Notice that it's also impossible to distinguish these states in a non-gravitational quantum field theory because in a non-gravitational QFT, this unitary operator, which is confined to this region, commutes with every operator at infinity. And since it commutes with every operator at infinity, you know, it, it leaves all correlators at infinity exactly unchanged. And so in a local quantum field theory, it would be impossible to distinguish between these two states. Okay. Now, how do you do it in gravity? For this particular example that I took, where I took these two states, it's actually quite simple. We look at the correlation function of this boundary Hamiltonian that I said, which was just a key component of the metric and the insertion of this field phi one itself. So if I look at this two point function, which I remind you was one of the correlators whose equality I imposed in my, my proof, I look at the expectation of this in the state one, a very simple computation will tell us that you get this answer. Notice this correlator is measured at infinity. Okay, this correlator is measured in this region. It's measured for small time band, but it's measured at infinity. Even though the excitation is confined to the middle of ADS and I'm measuring something at a space-like separation and non-gravitational field theory, every such correlator would not see the excitation. In gravity, you see it does see the excitation. You can compute it explicitly and you find a certain formula. And one can show, in fact, that if you're given this correlation, this Whiteman correlator for an infinitesimal amount of time, uh, it's, you can reconstruct completely the function f. Uh, but what's important in terms of distinguishing the global symmetry fields is that if you compute this h phi 1 correlator in the state 2, then you would find it 0. And conversely, in the state which has the excitation of the field 1, if you computed the h phi 2 correlator, uh, that's just 0. So you see that, you know, the correlators H phi 1 and H phi 2 can not only distinguish the states 1 from 2, but they can also tell us what the form of the state is. And I think this example brings out very clearly how uh, a theory of gravity differs uh, from both non-gravitational field theories where this would be impossible and also from classical gravity where this would be impossible. And I emphasize that we made absolutely no assumptions in this computation except for just imposing uh, the wheeler devitt equation consistently and dressing these states correctly as they should be dressed by the wheeler devitt equation. But, but uh, 
but you're also using the structure of, as in, of ADS uh, space-time, right? I mean, you're making some dynamical assumption, uh, this reflecting boundary conditions and things that are necessary for ADS to make sense as a deterministic theory are uh, not playing any role in this. I mean, they, they are, they are. I mean, the, the yeah. reason, I mean, the reason this example is not uh, illuminating to me is that I keep thinking, okay, yeah, of, of course, in ADS, uh, things are very different. You have this time-like boundary and everything is registered there. Uh, uh, but, yeah, you, you, uh, yeah, we are using it. I mean, I could have given you a similar example actually in flat space as well, uh, although I don't have that example, but we could do this particular experiment that I mentioned, uh, you know, where you take two excitations, uh, uh, if you in, in the paper that we have, we have it, it works very similarly in flat space. All that you will change is, in fact, uh, instead of this propagator in ADS, you'll get a different answer in flat space. So, for this excitation, it would work as well in flat space. Uh, but it's true that for the whole argument that I gave you right now about the Wheeler Divit equation, we used ADS because we don't have to worry about the infrared problems. Uh, we did, uh, you know, impose a reflecting boundary conditions. I'll have a little bit more to say about that at the end of the talk. But let me point out that, you know, from the point of view of local quantum field theory, this is still a slice and we are making observations which are space-like separated. Uh, and, you know, from the point of view of classical gravity, you know, we have the same theorems that we have in flat space. So, you know, if you take a spherically symmetric configuration, uh, you can't distinguish it from observations at infinity. And the same way in you know in local quantum field theory, space-like observations you know are unaffected by a unitary operator that's localized in the bulk. So this example at least brings out this difference between LQFTs and classical gravity and quantum gravity. Uh, but as I said, I could have done this example also in flat space, and that's why in the first part of the talk I mentioned things in flat space, uh, but in the second part uh, I'm now saying something in ADS. But the, what I wanted to emphasize was the difference between classical GR, a non-gravitational theory and quantum mechanics. And notice the time-like boundary is not important here because I'm really just, you know, I have a Cauchy slice and I'm, I'm measuring things at space-like separation. I mean, it's important in detail for our arguments, but not important for this example. Okay, maybe we can come back to the discussion uh, later. Uh, let me- uh, I have a, Sorry, I have yes, a please. About yes, please. Yes, um, please. Yeah, I, I want to go back, in fact, to the to the origin of the argument, like the constraint, because I think this is really the key, right, uh, uh, at the end. And um, I also want to, you know, go with Alessandro. I think we need, you know, there's a bit of confusion in the literature. We need to distinguish ADS boundary condition, which has no radiation. And therefore, if you don't have any radiation, you don't have the problem that Simone has, which is the, the problem of reconstruction of the radiation. So I think ADS, in some sense, is unitary by design, so that's not that's not the question. The question is, so for flat space, or I mean, it could be people have, have tried to relax boundary condition of ADS, assuming leaky boundary condition, then that would be interesting. But let's go back to your argument, which is uh, the gist of the argument, right? Uh, of saying there is a correlation between this boundary, the gazophenum and the bulk, the gazophenum. And, and it is true that most of the puzzles that people have before, you know, the the, the firewall paradox or, or even some, some part of the black hole information paradox ignore completely this correlation. So, so most of these formulations, so, you know, so, so what you're doing is, is the right thing. Like you need to take into account this correlation and then some of the paradox uh, might go away. Now, there's an analog of what you're saying, in fact, in flat space. It's, it's kind of, um, it's the issue of the memory effect. So, so the question, and, and it goes back to, it's, it's the idea, okay, you have some kind of boundary charges there, like the, you discuss the mass, but this is not the only one. And then you have all the radiation on top of it. And the question is, and there's a correlation, there's a very strong correlation between radiation and the boundary charge. You cannot ignore that, uh, like most paper in gravity, in so-called quantum gravity. But if you take into account, so now the, the central question of holography is how much of the radiation information can you recapture you know, from the boundary charge. And that, that, that's how I take the, not the symmetric argument, but the previous one. And, and what's uh, clear, because we, at, at the null infinity, we know that. We know, for instance, that if you only take into account the bond, so the bondy mass gives you something, but there's still a degeneracy. So there's still states that you can excite. 
uh, which have different radiation states, even if they have the same uh, kind of boundary mass. But then there's other charges, right? The angular momentum charges. And maybe in fact, you know, people are revealing uh, other charges like spin two charges and higher spin charge. So maybe the question there is, is the symmetry charge enough to reconstruct the information? And how big should the symmetry uh, charges be to reconstruct the information? I, I think- Yeah, I want to emphasize if that- you want to uh, claim, If you want to claim that only the mass, the body mass is enough, that's not going to be true, no. but-, but it, No, no, but I, I, I never claim that. Okay, yeah. okay, good. So, so, but- So I think the, the, the construction, and that's why the challenge for all of us is to understand what is the full symmetry group that can allow yeah us to reconstruct the information and the hope yeah there's there's a real hope that in fact it's possible is that is that where so you yeah, can I, yeah no no i i want to emphasize that i i i was not if you look at what's on the screen the energy of these two excitations is exactly the same so i do not want to reconstruct something only from the symmetry group even though i think that's an idea that that has been pursued it's very important that i want to look at correlation functions of the energy and of other dynamical degrees of freedom so in the case of flat space, the argument I gave you previously establishes that if one looks at arbitrary correlators of the Bondi mass and of other radiation fields near the past boundary of null infinity, that is enough to uniquely identify a state on future null infinity. In fact, this doesn't involve the question of unitarity because I'm defining the state on future null infinity and measuring it from its past boundary. So this is just a question within the Fox space. And I could have phrased the argument as I did here by just saying, Correlators of the Bondi mass and of radiation degrees of freedom near the past boundary of null infinity are enough to uniquely identify the state. It's actually not a difficult proof, as uh, this one is not either. But I want to emphasize I'm not only measuring the energy. That's why I gave this example, because these two states I said are, emphasized, are related by global symmetry. They obviously have the same energy, but it's correlators of the energy and of dynamical degrees of freedom. So that is enough to determine things. And we don't need to look in detail at the issue of the symmetry algebra, or the, you know, we need the, the global well, conserved I mean, charges, I mean, of course. Yeah, I, I but that's talking about your, your previous slide because this one where it's too much symmetry, I think I, you know, it doesn't- Well, the previous matter. slide, I could have made the same I argument. I, I think that, you know, if instead of this, uh, you, you assume, I don't think ADS is so different from flat space, even though I think that's, I mean, I but understand that some people have had that opinion, but let me just, yeah. Yeah, sorry, could I just say? Yeah. Uh, the same argument that the correlators of the ADM Hamiltonian raised to the power n, so these correlators uh, with the radiation fields with the Bondi news as u goes to minus infinity. So I would have to say here, you know, uh, it, the argument I gave you previously, if I were to rephrase it, I would say that correlators of h to the power n, ulm to the power m, and of n of u1, n of un, h to the power n1, qlm to the power m2. Uh, can you see? Yeah. Uh, these correlators where ui lives in minus infinity to minus one over epsilon, these correlators are enough to fix a state at scry plus. This is an argument in a Fox space, in fact, and the argument, I mean, one can show that this is indeed true. So this is the sense in which uh, the theory is holographic. Oh, give me one second, please. I, I realized I forgot to plug in my system. Uh, Yeah, so, so the, the, the argument I, I gave was, uh, was, was just this. Uh, it's, you know, the, I mean, I gave it in some different language, but one could phrase it in terms of correlators. So what the precise, I mean, there is a BMS group, but that, the details of that are not so important. I need the charges, but I need correlators of the charges and dynamical fields. So this N here is the Bondi news. Mm -hmm. So does that answer the question? I, maybe we can discuss more, maybe. Uh, maybe we, we can discuss more because there's another fine. version of, yeah, holography, which is yeah. only based where, uh, and yeah, yeah, let, let's where, maybe let's let's maybe go ahead and go back to the to the discussion at the end. I suggest. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me say something about the information paradox that Laurent already mentioned and the relevance of this. So, uh, I'm. Uh, can I take about ten minutes more? Is that okay? No. For sure, please. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so uh, let, let, let's first of all a cartoon version of this, right? The cartoon version of the, the, the point is that the holography of information implies that information about the black hole microstate is always outside available to observers outside with the right measurement. So you have a black hole and you're surrounded by these observers and, and you know, this information is just always available uh, 
uh, to these observers. So the information is not lost and that's a zero order version resolution of the, the paradox. Now, uh, there's a more formal way to say this. The more formal way to say this is that one can look at the von Neumann entropy. Uh, so here's an evaporating black hole space time in flat space, I've drawn the extended Penrose diagram. One can define the algebra of observables from minus infinity to U on scry plus, and one can define the von Neumann entropy, and one can prove subject to the results that I described previously, that this von Neumann entropy at scry plus is independent of U. And as a result, you know, this is the, the reason I have a finite intercept is because in the arguments I gave you, I didn't keep track of massive particles. Uh, but this is the statement that information does not emerge on sky plus and is not lost on sky plus, but is always present on sky plus. And that's the reason the state doesn't become more mixed or less mixed. So holography implies, if you believe holography you should hold in flat space, that this is what the fine grain entropy of the radiation must look like. Now, of course, uh, you will notice that this is not the same as uh, this is not the same as uh, you know the the argument uh, that Hawking had, uh, which is that uh, this fine grain entropy as a function of the retarded time grows monotonically. So, one of the questions that people ask often when we discuss this paradox is, uh, you know, fine, one has a different result. So, uh, I presented some result which one can prove based on some assumptions, and Hawking had a result and. Uh, a common question that is asked is, what is the error in Hawking's argument? So where is, where is it that, why is it that this result and the graph on the left differs from the graph on the right? And what, what is the precise difference? So in fact, it's not hard to isolate what the precise difference between these two arguments is. Uh, it's, the, it's the following fact, and if one goes back and looks at uh, what Hawking's argument was. So Hawking, in fact, the computation that Hawking performed was that of low point correlation functions. So in, in Hawking's original paper, Hawking computed occupancies of modes at null infinity and found that they were thermal. But it's important that occupancies of modes at null infinity are not enough of low point correlators are not enough to state that the final state is mixed. And the reason is just a basic result from statistical mechanics. It's the fact that mixed states are exponentially close to pure states. They're typically different at order e to the minus s by two. And so if one computes some low point correlators to any order in perturbation theory, that cannot be used to conclude that the final state is mixed. And so this computation by itself is not precise enough to argue that the final state is mixed. But in fact, in Hawking's paper, Hawking provided an argument uh, to suggest that the computation was robust. Uh, this argument is in fact often overlooked, but it was a very important part of Hawking's original paper. And Hawking's argument was phrased through what Hawking called the principle of ignorance. And here is where Hawking used it. On the left-hand side, I really have a screenshot from the paper. And Hawking said that about every black hole, one has to introduce a hidden surface and then apply the principle of ignorance to say that all field configurations on these hidden surfaces are equally probable subject to the conservation of the mass and angular momentum and other things which can be measured by surface integrals at a distance. This in our language is precisely the assumption that the Hilbert space factorizes up to a few global constraints that are imposed by the Nohead theorem. And of course, while this is true in, cl in the classical theory, this is not true in the quantum mechanical theory, as I emphasized previously, as we've been discussing from the beginning of the talk. And if one looks at correlators of the energy, quantum mechanical correlators of the energy and of other dynamical degrees of freedom, there is a lot more information that's available outside. In fact, all the information is available outside. And in, in particular, this assumption made by Hawking that the Hilbert space factorizes, which is at a specific point in the paper, uh, is where the error in Hawking's argument is. So I think uh, the, there's a clear answer to the question of why the answer we are presenting at null infinity differs from the answer that Hawking had. And it is that in this paragraph in Hawking's paper, there's an assumption of factorization that's made. And that assumption fails in a theory of gravity. I should say that this uh, result is also different from the conventional page curve, which is also often discussed in the literature, which is that I presented an, an entropy at scry plus, which was constant as a function of retarded time. And that's not the same as this tent shaped page curve, which is the curve that goes up and then comes down. So why is there a difference with the page curve? In fact, it's the same issue. It's the fact that if one looks at the argument that Page provided, uh, the argument that Page provided explicitly assumes factorization. It says that you know we think of a pure state and we divide it into two subsystems. One has dimension m, the other has dimension n, and then one computes the entropy of the smaller subsystem. This 
calculation is perfectly correct. It's extremely useful and a very nice calculation and is very useful in non-gravitational systems. But what it tells us is that systems where the Hilbert space factorizes must obey a page curve, but it doesn't tell us that a black hole must obey a page curve. And in fact, when this argument was applied to black holes by Page, Page argued explicitly that one should think of the radiation and the black hole as factorized subsystems of a total Hilbert space, which has a dimension, which is a product of the independent dimensions. But since the point of the argument that I was giving previously is that the black hole space time does not factorize in this manner, one should also not expect the radiation entropy uh, to follow a Page curve. Uh, maybe there's one more question which I should try and address, which is that, you know, one might also ask, uh, you know, we are giving this arguments, but, you know, if I have a set of qubits or I have some ordinary statistical systems, then one does expect that to be a page curve, even though we live in a world where gravity is presumably quantized. So, you know, if one takes, takes some evaporating coal or, you know, some set of qubits, then that does obey a page curve, whereas if one were to wait beyond the edge, you know, end of the universe and wait for Sagittarius A star to evaporate, we would not expect its radiation entropy to obey a page curve. So why is there a difference between coal and Sagittarius A star? And the difference is that for ordinary statistical systems, uh, there is a well-defined limit we can take where we can keep track of the entanglement entropy, but switch off all of these effects I'm talking about. And the limit is simply that in D dimensions, we take G Newton times the energy to the D minus two to zero, while we keep the entropy of the system finite. Uh, it's important that, you know, we have to keep track to keep track of the entanglement entropy of effects of size E to the minus S. Uh, otherwise, you know, we can't even distinguish between pure states and mixed states, which have very different entanglement entropies. But for ordinary systems, even though we live in a world with quantum gravity, we are in a limit where the entropy is finite, but Planck scale effects are going to zero. But for black holes, such a limit doesn't exist because GE to the D minus two, where you know, the energy we are talking about is the energy of a typical excitation, which is the Hawking temperature, is the inverse of the entropy. So there is no nice limit in which we can take for black holes the, uh, these gravitational effects to zero while keeping the entropy finite. And that is the reason that for questions of the fine grain entropy of black holes, one cannot ignore gravitational effects and think of them as if it's a non-gravitational system. Whereas for a set of 10 qubits one has in a lab, one can. And even though we live in a world with gravity, one can, but for black holes, one cannot. And it's this reason, it's the fact that you know, gravitational effects are tied to the entropy. The entropy of black holes is a quantum gravity effect, which it is not for other systems. Okay, uh, let me just spend a few minutes uh, 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 making link with some of the recent literature on the page curve. I'll be brief since I, uh, I perhaps most of the audience may not be most interested in this issue, but let me just say it for those who have followed uh, the recent literature on uh, islands and the page curve. So of course, uh, while, uh, while I was giving this past two slides, uh, uh, I'm sure some of you thought that there's been very significant recent activity on computing the page curve of ADS black holes. In fact, the results I'm giving are not in contradiction with any of the results in the literature. Uh, so there's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of very nice work. Uh, but the reason is that the, what has been computed in these recent uh, papers is something rather different. And it's important to be clear what, what has been computed. What one does is one takes a black hole and prepares it in ADS. So this is my cartoon. Here's a black hole and one prepares it in ADS. And then one couples the entire system of black hole plus ADS to a non-gravitational bath, which is my pink region that surrounds it. Okay. So it's important that in this setup, gravity is not dynamical throughout space. And then in the non-gravitational bath, we make an imaginary interface, which is outside the gravitational region. That's this dashed line. And of course, in this non-gravitational bath, uh, you know, the Hilbert space factorizes by construction, and then the page curve that is measured is the transfer of information across this interface in the non-gravitational bar. It's also important that the theory of gravity in these setups has a mass, and this is related to some of the comments that were made earlier about leaky boundary conditions in ADS, which I'll return to. But that's the reason that the results I'm describing, I was describing earlier, do not apply to these, these calculations because they involve the setup, which is different from the setup that I was describing. Let me just try and say this very briefly. Uh, so uh, let me first try and describe the nature of information transfer. As I said, you know, we should think of this as a two-step process. We think of first preparing an ADS black hole and by the arguments I, I gave, and of course, you know, by, by what we know about ADS CFT for many years, uh, 
we believe that the boundary of this region or the degrees of freedom near the boundary already know everything about the ADS black hole. So information is not emerging from the black hole according to the page curve. It's already available outside the black hole, as I was saying earlier. Then one couples this to a non-gravitational bath. And of course, you know, now we have just a system. In fact, that the precise description of the system is as a BCFT, a CFT on a space with a boundary. And then we have information flowing from one part of this non-gravitational setup to another part. And of course, the Hilbert space factorizes. And this non-gravitational computation does lead to a page curve. It's a very nice computation, the fact that one can actually do this computation. But it's, a, it's not a question that's measuring how information emerges or the entropy of the radiation. What one is computing is information transfer in, across two parts of this bath. Now, uh, in fact, one can show that if the bath has made gravitating, as we showed in this paper last year, where one turns on gravity also in the bath, then the page curve vanishes. So there is no page curve if one turns on gravity in the bath. And so these calculations really do require this non-gravitational region where gravity is exactly zero. And they're not measuring how information emerges from the black hole from one part to another part of the gravitational region. And that means that you know one should be very careful about generalizing these lessons to black holes and standard theories of gravity, where we do not have a gravitational, a non-gravitational bath. Uh, there's in fact a little bit more that uh, I should say, and that is that you know these computations they involve what's an elegant island rule, and this is in fact the same setup I had previously, except I've now drawn it in space time to make clear the emergence of this island. And this part, this triangle is the non-gravitational bath, and this rectangle in the middle is ADS. And it so happens that in these calculation, one finds that, you know, of course, information is flowing from ADS into the non-gravitational bath, but at late times, it so happens that a region R here, a radiation region, describes an island in the middle of the gravitational region. So the degrees of freedom of this gravitational region are found here. And the degrees of freedom of this black part are found in the complement of R. So in particular, you know, even within the gravitational region, the asymptotic boundary of the gravitational region lacks information about this island within the gravitational region. And this is in tension with what I said previously, which is that I said that the information in the gravitational region is always available near its boundary. And you see that at late times in these setups, this is not the case. In fact, uh, the resolution to this puzzle is that almost all these computations have been performed in theories of gravity where the graviton has a mass. This was noted by Haugeng and Andreas Karch uh, last year. It was earlier thought to be a technicality, but in fact, we were able to show in this recent work that if you take a theory of gravity where the graviton is massless and in particular where the Gauss law applies, then the island story is inconsistent. In fact, one can show an explicit contradiction uh, with the island story if the Gauss law applies. And so the fact that the graviton is massive is very important for the story to be consistent. And the way, uh, uh, you know, the way that works is the following, and this is actually relevant to the comments that were made about leaky ADS boundary conditions. So these setups, in fact, do involve ADS with leaky boundary conditions where information is allowed to leak out of ADS. But in fact, if you do that, if you think of ADS with leaky boundary conditions, the theory of gravity that one gets in the bulk is very different, and it's a theory of massive gravity. And there's a very simple ADS CFT way to understand that, and that is that you know, before we couple the theory to the bath, there is a stress tensor on the boundary of the theory, and the stress tensor is conserved. Sorry, is there a question? There a question or? Okay. Oh, I think it was, uh, yeah. Okay, fine, sorry. So there's a stress tensor on the boundary of ADS and the stress tensor is conserved. And after we couple it to a bath, the stress tensor on the boundary of ADS is not conserved. But the fact that it's not conserved in conformal representation theory is almost, you know, it tells you that this stress tensor on the boundary of ADS picks up what's called an anomalous dimension. And this, by the standard rules of ADS CFT, tells you that the graviton in ADS uh, picks up a mass. And so that's why the non-gravitational bath and leaky boundary conditions in ADS always come hand in hand with the mass for the graviton. It's not so easy to switch off reflecting boundary conditions in ADS. And the reason, uh, you know, uh, massive gravity is very different. Uh, this is just a cartoon. Uh, there's, there are more details in the paper. But here's a, you can see the difference immediately in the linearized theory. You know, in the linearized theory of gravity, just standard gravity, 
these are the constraints which relate the constraint metric to the local energy density. And if you integrate this, you know, because the, this left hand side is a total divergence, you find that the integral of the energy density is the integral of some surface integral of some metric fluctuation. In massive gravity, the analogous constraint is just this. It's that, you know, you have some divergence, but then there's plus a mass squared term for the metric, and that's equal to the local energy density. So in a theory of massive gravity, the Hamiltonian is not a boundary term. In fact, it's because you broke part of the diffeomorphism invariance. And so there is also no Gauss law in a theory of massive gravity. And this is true from what we know from other cases. You know, there's a VDVZ discontinuity that's known, which is that massive gravity often behaves qualitatively differently from massless theories of gravity. And so this is the reason you know, we don't have a Gauss law and neither do massive theories of gravity have a principle of holography of information. And in fact, we can explicitly see, you know, it's not just this analysis, we can explicitly see that in the so-called Karch-Randall models that have massive gravity, islands are consistent and they are consistent in theories of this kind. And that's not a contradiction with what I said previously about the holography of information in standard theories of gravity. Okay, I went through this last part fast. I'm happy to give more details if there are questions and if there's interest, but let me just summarize since I'm already over time. Uh, so the main point I wanted to make was that standard theories of gravity store quantum information very differently from local quantum field theories. Uh, this can be established in some settings. This is a general slogan, but it can be established in some settings. I gave you in particular a non-perturbative operator theoretic argument in flat space. Uh, I also gave you a perturbative analysis in ADS. And I think this uh, leads to an understanding of why gravitational theories are holographic, why ADS CFT works as well as it does. Uh, so the, the message of what I said was that in gravitational theories, one cannot specify the state inside a bounded region and on its complement independently. And this is relevant for several versions of the information paradox and also for some of its putative resolutions where it is assumed that one can specify the state independently and recognizing that one can't help to resolve some of these paradoxes. Uh, there has been a lot of parallel work on the information paradox through the island story, uh, but in fact, the appearance of islands is inconsistent in standard theories of gravity, uh, but it is consistent in specific theories of massive gravity, which is where these computations have been done. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your patience and apologies for going over time. Thanks a lot. So we already had interesting questions. We can either continue the discussions or maybe uh, take a few more questions. Are... Yeah, Daniel has a raised hand. Uh, yeah, hi, Sawat. Um, hi, so, hi, Dennis. Uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on this connection to massive gravity so that islands imply this? Because I thought there was an example uh, uh, just in 2D gravity, uh, basically using the Chekhov Teitelbaum model or some version thereof where people came to found islands. So in which sense is this a massive theory or? or? In, uh, thank you. So indeed, that's the reason I use the word almost. Uh, it's because we don't understand quite how the 2D story works. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't even, I don't understand in what sense the, I mean, this is something that we discussed earlier. Uh, so in, in higher dimension, there's a sense in which the graviton picks up a mass and we understand the constraints of the theory and how the constraints change when the graviton picks up a mass. Uh, in 2D, in a JT gravity coupled to a bath, I don't know how to make that uh, difference precise uh, and how coupling it to a bath changes uh, JT gravity from the original theory and how the constraints change. Uh, so that's that's an answer. Uh, so that's so indeed everything I said applied to higher dimensional theories and the puzzle that we had showing that islands were inconsistent also applied to theories uh, in higher than one plus one dimension. I think very strongly that there should be an analogous story in JT gravity, but uh, you're probably much better place to to tell us the answer to that than than I am because uh, we don't yet have a good enough understanding of how JT gravity has changed. So well, in, in high dimensions, you know, this thing. Yeah, yeah. So in high dimensions, this computation has been done. I gave you some ADS CFT argument, but there's also a bulk argument, you know, which was done by Purati. There were these computations that showed that if you turn on these leaky boundary conditions, there's a one loop effect that causes the graviton to pick up a mass. So it's a subtle effect, which, you know, one uh, later there was a slick ADS CFT argument that was discovered, but it's a kind of a subtle effect, which occurs because you broke part of the diffeomorphism invariance. But uh, I, I suspect there should be something similar for JT gravity, but I don't know what it is. Okay, 
thanks, thanks. And I mean, maybe relatedly, so, so, so what is, again, actually the, the precise statement about islands? I mean, because islands could also appear just, uh, uh, you know, you extremize some generalized area functional and there could be disconnected components that uh, uh, uh. make it, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there could be disconnected components that that uh, lead to a minimization of this generalized error function. Yeah, uh, yeah. So thank you. So, so indeed, the argument we have uh, shows that one. So you know, you're right that from extremization, it's not clear why you shouldn't get such components. But the argument shows that if you if you have an entanglement wedge that does not contain a part of the asymptotic region at all, so it's entirely a bounded region then such an entanglement wedge would lead to a puzzle with the Gauss law. Now you're right that we don't show this by showing that you can never find extremization, you know, but it's a prediction of our puzzle that if you were to look at quantum extremal surfaces, you would never find an entanglement wedge that's a bounded region. Okay. okay. Although, you know, uh, a priori you could have found it, but the prediction is that you would never find an entanglement wedge that's bounded as okay, islands are okay. in, in okay, a standard okay. theory of gravity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Stefano, yeah. Thank you. Hi, Sarad. Um, I have a question, which is maybe more an inter interpretation question, which is, it uh, seems like from your argument, you have these correlations that are, but they can resolve the paradox as long as you don't have a path. But if you have a path, then that doesn't apply because you have no gravity at all. So it seems like if you consider a situation where say you have a flat space time, for example, and you, you are asymptotically far away, it seems like there should be at least perturb perturbatively very close to being a bath, but you still have a gravity theory. So that, that gravitates, that, that radiation gravitates. And so it seems like you don't have really uh, these effects. So is the point that what we should interpret your argument and these uh, subleading correctness that resolve the paradox as a, some kind of non-perturbative effect that cannot be intuitively understood as a small perturbation over bath, say, a small uh, perturbation. No, I think, I, I think that even in flat space, I think indeed this was the intuition that underlies some of these arguments that they are models for flat space because you go far away and gravity becomes weak and we can forget about these effects. But I think the lesson is that, that you know, weak gravity is different from, from no gravity. And that's something that we also see in other cases. You know, uh, we should not think that we can just take weak gravity and just forget about gravity being present. In particular, you know, in these non-gravitational baths, one doesn't know the mass that's left inside. So, uh, you know, if one were to look at flat space and one goes far away, it becomes harder to determine the mass of the energy inside, but it also becomes harder to detect the radiation because the radiation is also falling off and becoming weaker. So, you know, if you have detectors that can keep track of the radiation at large R, uh, then those detectors can also keep track of the mass. And in the case where you have literally no gravity, they can't, they just don't know, there's no Gauss law, you know, because gravity just switches off. And so I think even within perturbation theory, one would see a difference uh, between weak gravity and no gravity. And uh, I think the lesson is that one should be careful about, you know, conflating the two, weak gravity is not no gravity. So you said that this kind of um, no local correlation is necessarily yeah, if you have gravity because it's some no perturbative effect that you cannot just consider as having a fast space time with more gravitational perturbations on that. Or... Uh, you, so you can see it in simple states. So let, let me say, so, you know, one has to be careful about when these effects are important and when they're not. In general, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated question, but let's say one looks at just flat space-time and one looks at uh, some radiation stream that's going to come and hit the space-time at a later time, maybe at retarded time zero. And one is sitting at retarded time near minus infinity and one tries to determine, you know, whether the radiation is going to come at retarded time zero using these effects. Then in perturbation theory, a two-point correlation of the ADM Hamiltonian and the new tensor near retarded time minus infinity can distinguish whether a shockwave is going to come later or is not going to come later. This is a perturbative calculation in flat space. So, you know, these effects are also visible within perturbation theory. That being said, you know, one is not saying that one can determine all black hole microstates within perturbation theory because black hole microstates are separated by non-perturbative differences. So if you want to determine what the black hole microstate is, of course, one needs non-perturbative accuracy. Uh, 
But if you want to determine, you know, if there's a shock wave coming at late times, and that's it's a simple state, just empty space with a shock wave, and we want to know the profile of the shock wave from early times, uh, then one can do that indeed. Uh, and within perturbation theory, one does not need a non perturbative argument, it's just a perturbative argument in flat space. It's, it's the same argument I presented. I can uh, show the slide again if you like, but it's, uh, it's, it's just a two point function of the ADM Hamiltonian and the new tensor at early times, which will detect already the new tensor, the shock wave at late times. Uh, I don't know if that's clear. Should I, I can write, should, would you like me to write down a formula? I can, I can do that if you like, uh, let's see, uh, it's, uh, let, let, I have yeah, a let, question. Let me, oh, sure. Go on, please. Yes. Yeah. yeah go on, please. Yeah. Maybe I, mean, I can. If you write. want to finish. Uh, I, well, I, I was just going to say that that the state I'm looking at was you know e to the i f of u, n of u integral maybe from zero to one, acting on the vacuum. So I don't. Let, let's forget about the different soft vacuum. So you you take a state of this kind, uh, then you can check that in. Let's call the state one. That in the state one, if you look at the correlation of h and n of u. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll get something which will look like if I forget the exact formula, but uh, uh, so this correlator, you'll get f of x minus u cubed. So this integral uh, over x uh, goes from zero to one, but this correlator has support even at u near minus infinity. So this integral over x, uh, sorry, uh, integral is over x. Uh, so, you know, even if I make an insertion at minus infinity near u equal to minus infinity, this correlator has support, uh, even though the, 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 the state I created was only near, you know, the state was here, it's near u equal to zero. And the measurement I'm making is here. Uh, and uh, you can see this is a perturbative calculation in flat space. It's the same, it's similar to the calculation I showed you, which shows in perturbation theory, these effects are already important. Thank you. Okay, so um, um, so can one uh, so have you considered or can you recover? I mean, this in the asymptotically flat case, the semi-classical limit that, uh, namely Einstein's equations. I mean, reconstruct the space-time inside satisfying Einstein's equations uh, from, from the boundary. So that that we have uh, something yeah. very. Uh, helpful. If, uh, uh, so, so in flat space, that has not been done as far as I know, but I can let me say something trivial here. Let me put back in factors of h bar and c. So this two point function has an h bar c by c cubed. If I take the limit where, you know, h uh, bar goes to zero, this two point function just vanishes. So at least the fact that in classical gravity, so, you know, the, this, the setup I have here, just to complete the Penrose diagram is that there's a shock wave, which is coming and hitting null infinity at near u equal to zero. And I'm trying to determine it from here. And the answer I wrote is how in perturbation theory, you could determine uh, from near the past boundary what the profile of the shock wave was. Uh, but this is a correlator which is explicitly multiplied with the factor of h bar and g. And so at least in the limit where I take the Planck length to zero, this, this correlator goes away and I recover the usual localization of information. Uh, you're asking a higher order question, which is can one also recover the dynamics, which we haven't, uh, we haven't made any progress on uh, in flat space. I mean, you can look at semi-classical states in your Hilbert space, I suppose, and try to reconstruct, I mean, yeah. To, to yeah, get, uh, uh, to yeah, yeah, the approach I was, I was describing is kind of not very well suited to that because, you know, I was taking what, we, what one can call an out-out approach. You know, I was defined, the state I defined is a state that's defined on scribe plus. And I was also trying to detect the state, but from another point of scribe plus. Uh, the dynamics of the theory is all in the S matrix, which is in the mapping between the Fox space at scry minus and the Fox space at scry plus. Uh, so, uh, you know, so to do the dynamics, we'll have to also talk about this map. Uh, but to talk about information, we don't need to talk about the map. And that's why we talk about the holography of information, uh, which is just that the Fox space and scry plus can be detected from any part of scry, um, not any part, the past boundary of scry plus. Uh, there is a more interesting question about dynamics, which I agree is very interesting. I just, uh, I, we don't have so much to say about it. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Um, okay, I already asked a lot of questions. So if other people wants to talk, uh, you know, I, I'll wait. Um, 
um yeah so yeah so right so so thank you for this uh, for this talk and uh, you know for for making the point which you know i totally agree with your conclusion that that for many many years we have been submitted to quantum gravity you know where subsystems are are, are you know tensor and there's no correlation between bulk and boundary and and most of the paradox we see in the literature stems from this wrong hypothesis. So the fact that you're going there, you know, is is is, is really good, and you're making a good point. Uh, you should be making a lot of friends. I don't know, in your corner. I don't know how people are reacting to that because all their business is based on this factorization. So I, I'm wondering how we kind of uh, survive. Maybe an interesting, uh, yeah, uh, life. Because anyway, but anyway, I support that that crusade. It's it has to be done. It is absolutely basic that, as, as the answer you said to Stefano, it's, it's it, you know, even in the approximation, it's like, uh, this hypothesis is completely wrong, even in semi-classical gravity. So uh, saying it over and over again is, is important. I want to go back to, in fact, the, the, the slides you have and the discussion you were having, and maybe it's the question of Alex sure. also, which I, I want to link the discussion you're having about the fact that, okay, I can see you, you, you assume that, you know, you have this, um, let's say, N of U, you know, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, tensor at different points, and then you use the, the, the charges and these correlations kind of uh, uh, have, have some non-local information because of the Gauss law. Um, now, I think there is, there is a, and, and that's, that's, I think that's perfectly fine, and then it's about the state, but I think there's a deeper uh, um, um, goal somehow behind holography, and that's maybe what, what uh, Simone was uh, getting at, or also Alessandro, and this is also what I'm interested in, which is, well, can we reconstruct this operator N of U, not just this correlation, because here you have to assume that guy exists at a certain property, but can we really access that? that uh, 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 you know information about uh, about the new sensor from uh, uh, the boundary and there you know of course that, that that this is in that context that I was talking about this this uh, boundary symmetry and there is an interesting result in fact uh, by uh, Banerjee right about the s matrix what, what that these guys have been doing is looking at the at the so there's evidence that this could be possible maybe it doesn't work but there and you know, there's a calculation about the S matrix where you, let's say, suppose you, you restrict to, to yourself to the MHV sector. So it's only self dual gravity, if you want. But then you can show that these boundary charges are completely enough in terms of their wild identity to entirely uh, uh, const reconstruct the correlator. Okay. So I think, you know, and, and that, that would answer the question of Alessandro. Reconstructing the correlator for any U is a reconstruction of the dynamics at the quantum level. Of course, it's only done for a subsector here, and people only use part of the symmetry. So, uh, you know, I was wondering how you, you, I think at some point, you know, how you, you, you place yourself with this other project, which is kind of a maybe complementary, right? So, yeah. Uh, so I, I agree with you that so so first of all as you say we are reconstructing the correlator at scribe plus but I think the question that Alejandro was asking for the dynamics you'd need to reconstruct the correlator at scribe minus so that's a harder so here I mean just to say uh, what we had here was uh, just to share this whiteboard again you know we had a state which was defined on scribe plus and we were reconstructing the state for, by measuring correlators near u goes to minus infinity so so this is this is a, a this is a, um, you know, we, we measure this and we can reconstruct the correlator at late times from this measurement at minus infinity. Of course, we use not just the symmetry charges, but other, other correlators. Uh, but uh, to reconstruct the dynamics, I think we need to know, you know, what the state at scry minus was. And that's a harder problem. Uh, there, there's in, in a very interesting question, which is, uh, what if I didn't allow you to use even the new tensor, which I think is what you were getting at, but only use the conserved charges and the charges in the algebra would that entirely fix uh, the the state? So in ADS CFT, by the way, we know the answer to the question, and the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because if I give you all the Casimirs of the conserved charges, I can fix the representation that the excitation general degeneracies of the representation. So you might have a single representation occurring more than once. So in ADS CFT, at least in the well understood example, we know that the symmetry charges by themselves are not enough to fix the state. 
Uh, now in flat space, as you say, the representation theory is not so well understood. Even the symmetry algebra is not so well understood. So I don't know what the answer to that is. And maybe the answer is yes. Uh, but in ADS, at least the answer seems to be that only charges generate representations. Yeah, but presumably in ADS, I mean, what we're learning in this business is that people were the group of gravity. So the quest for what is the full symmetry group is on. And, and it's clear that yeah, what people have looked at ADS is only a sliver of the of the structure, and and you know the it's uh, clear from the yeah, okay, that, that, case yeah. that the group of symmetry is much more rich and complicated that that we 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 could have expected uh, only a few years ago. So okay, maybe that's true in ADS, but in ADS we also have I, I mean the, some is, dual CFT perspective and so on. Yeah, yeah, so someone yeah, had to comment, the, dual, yeah. the dual CFT perspective. It you know it doesn't it doesn't allow radiation so at some point you have to go back to the issue of radiation so I think ADS is yeah it, it's kind of a yeah it, it doesn't contain the real problem yet uh, compared to flat space at least so so I I, I would expect uh, okay. flat space we understand something and from there we inform back what we have to do with ADS to include uh, you know non-reflective boundary conditions or more general boundary conditions that change the asymptotic structures or yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything very detailed to say about that, but I mean, as I said, I'm a little worried about allowing leaky boundary conditions in ADS. It's non-trivial to do that, do that because if one does that, it runs into these one-loop effects and so on, which change the theory of gravity. So. Uh, yeah. Oh no, no, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's not. It's yeah. not trivial. I agree. It's not trivial. And okay. I think what people have done so far is, is yeah, it's it's non-gravitational. So, yeah. Okay. I agree with your analysis, except for maybe one work or two of. There's an interesting work of Compere and Ruzziconi, where they are the only work I know which have really kind of allowed a form of leaky boundary conditions, properly taking into account the Gauss law, if you want. And that that's pretty technical. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with the work of Compare and trying to looking at flat space slicing, but maybe not. Maybe I should look more carefully at at, at this in terms of uh, leaky yeah. boundary conditions. So thank thank you for the lessons. Yeah. All right, are there remaining questions? Okay, if not, I will stop the recording and we can thank uh, Souvrat again. So thanks.